Okay, well, apparently it's saying that I'm live. So thank you to those of you who have turned up. Um, if you can't hear me, if anyone could like, this has happened to me before on live, if you could just say like, we can't hear you, but if not, I'm just going to begin. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get pretty much straight into it. But if you are willing to take on a couple of jobs while I do it, then I'd really appreciate that. So um, as you can tell, I probably do not enjoy. OK, good. Thank you, Dewey. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right, by the way. I've never said it out loud before. Um, so, yeah, I do not enjoy public speaking. So if I kind of like pause and try and catch my breath, I'm also like, um, oh, good. <laughs> Um, I'm also terribly anemic and I have not been taking my iron supplements for a while, so I'm like very out of breath. Yes, heckle me, please go for it for the added pressure. Um, but if you're willing to do a couple of jobs for me, it would be helpful if somebody could time me. So when I get up here and I like start speaking, it's meant to be 20 minutes long. Now it's too difficult for me to try and time myself while I'm speaking and I will not have any time guides while I'm doing my presentation. Um, so if someone would be happy to and then just at the end like cool thank you um, just at the end be like oh you ran over by like ages or like no you did like good like 19 minutes or something that'd be helpful and then if while you're watching I don't know if you just want to think about any moments where it's like, this was really boring, or like, I had no idea what you were saying, or you really rushed through this, or, you know, your voice like was really shaky and we couldn't understand you, thank you. <laughs> um, then, you know, that would be really helpful. And I mean, this is designed to be for people who are working at like a PhD level, but who have no idea about my subject. Like the people who I'm presenting this to aren't even in the same discipline as me. They study education. So I would really like this talk to be accessible for people at all levels of knowledge and understanding, because it's one that I would like to try and give at like public lectures. So yeah, let me know if you understand it or not. Um, but I'm gonna go off screen for like one second, try and like breathe it out and calm myself down and come back in like two seconds and then I will begin okay so it should be 20 minutes and we're talking about this book right here so I'll be explaining that in a moment so I'm gonna go off and breathe bye hello um I'm very very defensive of this book I'm very defensive of this book. More specifically, I'm defensive of its value. And I don't mean its value like how much it cost me to buy on Amazon. I think it was like four quid or something. And it's 30 pages. So it's not, it's not a long book. You could, you could read it in an hour. But I'm incredibly defensive of its value. Now, before I go off and just like rant on and on and on about how valuable I think this book is, and I really do think it is as a, just a piece of literature to read um, for the history of literature, the history of publication, Black British history, British history as a whole, slavery, colonial history, social history, the history of religious thinkers, and actually just an insight into the mind of somebody who lived 250 years ago. I think this is really incredibly valuable text. But what is it before I go on and on and on? It is, let me try and get this right, a narrative of the most remarkable particulars of the life of James Albert Ocasor Graniasor. It is a memoir, if you didn't catch that from the title. It is a memoir published in 1772, and it is the first publication that we have from a Black Britain. Now, it's not the first publication that we have from a Black person in Britain. That actually goes to a woman called Phyllis Wheatley, and she publishes her own life story two years before this. She's a Black American woman, and she comes over to England. She publishes her story, and then she goes straight back off to America again and leaves. But what she leaves behind her is this kind of legacy that spurs on other Black British people to want to share their own story. 
And James Albert Uxor Graniosaur is the first person to do that after she leaves. Two years later, he publishes this book. So hopefully already you are feeling like, yeah, of course it's a valuable book. Like I can understand exactly why you're saying it's a valuable book. But believe it or not, <laughs> there are people who dismiss and question the value of this book to all of the different disciplines that I've been discussing, but just in general as something that you ought to read as a casual reader. But before I get into that, I just want to explain a bit more who wrote this book, why they wrote it, who paid for its publication, uh, who the intended audience was, and kind of like a little bit of what is in these 30 pages. And believe me, there is actually quite a lot packed into these 30 pages. So I'm going to explain that. Hopefully, by the time I have done that, you will be fully with me and you will be saying, yes, this is an extremely valuable book, Abby. We do not question you. It is a valuable book. OK, and then I'm going to explain to you the people who don't think it's valuable. And there's quite a lot of them who dismiss its value. So James Albert Uxorgoniosaur, he is um, a black man living in Britain in the 18th century. He was actually originally from Africa. Um, he was captured in slavery as a child, then sold on several times to different people who bought him. He ended up living in mainland Europe, and then he's eventually given his freedom, moves to Britain as a free black man, marries a black British woman. They settle down, have a family. He gets a few different jobs doing different bits and bobs. And no, they don't really live happily ever after because they are very shortly plunged into abject, miserable, relentless poverty. And by the end of this book, he and his family are on the verge of really starving to death. And he is begging for the support of the reader to give them some financial relief. So that is the contents of this book. These are his words. He did not write them down with a pen himself. Um, it is thought that his English was not strong enough in terms of literacy, writing and reading to be able to write down his own story. So that's what we are told. Um, it was a young woman who actually wrote it down for him, but we believe he would have gone you know, to her house, spoke it aloud, told her his life story and she would have written it down for him. That's what we think happened. The woman who paid for its publication, um, she took pity on James Albert Uxorgoniosaur. She you know, was really broken by his story of poverty and, and seeing the, the miserable circumstances of his family. And so she said, well, look, share your story. I will pay for the publication because publishing things does cost money and I'll pay for it. And then we can sell it to my friends and family and all these different people. They can buy copies and that money can go to you and your family. OK, and so he agrees to this. And wasn't that a nice thing for her to do for him? Something else you should know about this woman, I can't remember if I've said her name, it was Selena Hastings. She is a Calvinist. Now you may or may not know what a Calvinist is or why that might be relevant to a man who has lived as a slave. Um, Selena Hastings is also a slave owner. So she owns plantations in America. Starting to complicate matters a little bit, isn't it? And she's a Calvinist. He is also a Calvinist. James Albert Uxogroniosaur is also a Calvinist. The people that this book is being sold to are also Calvinists. So it's an important thing. And if you if you don't know a lot about it, it doesn't matter because I'm just going to give you a really brief um, introduction to it. And I'm just going to tell you the one thing that you need to know about these people that will maybe influence your understanding of this book. So Calvinists are not like, you're not going to go down to a Calvinist church. There's no church, you know, on the high street that says Calvinists on it. Calvinists are turning up to your Anglican churches. They're going to be there at your Methodist church, your Baptist church. Maybe they don't go to any church that you recognise at all. It is more of a religious ideology. So the only thing I can liken it to today is like how you you might turn up to church and be sitting next to somebody whose ideology is conservative or you might be sitting next to somebody whose ideology is more liberal. And that is generally how we split kind of our ideology today. Well, in the 18th century, we have the Calvinists and the others who I'm not going to give you the name of today because it's just going to confuse things and complicate things for you. But the Calvinists have one very strong ideology. And one of the things that they believe in, the thing that is relevant for us today, 
is double predestination. That's right, not once, but twice you are predestined. And hopefully you'll understand why that is relevant to this. So double predestination. Not only is it that everything that happens to you in life has been decided already by God, okay? So if you are enslaved as a child and you spend your whole life in slavery, and maybe then you're later freed and you spend the rest of that life in poverty, starving, that is what God has decided for you. And the only thing you can do is thank God for having given you that existence. You do not question him. You do not question if you can change what is going to happen in your life. You just accept it. That is what a good Christian does. They just accept what God has chosen for them. OK, that's all you need to be working on is accepting and thanking God for choosing whatever it is that he chooses for you, whether that is wealth and fame and luxury or poverty and misery. He's chosen it. You just got to accept it. That's one part of the predestination. Double predestination comes in when not only is your life on earth predetermined, but whether or not you are going to heaven or hell has already been decided. Before you were even born, God decided whether or not you were going to heaven or hell. So nothing you do during your life can change that. And you don't get to know. So you've just got to live your life being this good Christian who doesn't question God, okay? And you don't get to know whether at the end of that life you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. You are double predestined and you just have to accept it. Now, the reason why this is so relevant for all these people is because that Calvinist ideology is much more compatible with thinking slavery is either a good thing or an OK thing that we don't need to have a problem with. In the 1770s, we haven't got this overwhelming kind of view in Britain that slavery is a bad thing. It's just starting to split off. You've got your people who are like, hey, maybe this slavery that we're doing is actually a really bad, corrupt, morally repugnant thing. And then other people who are like, yeah, it's God's will. So let's not question it. That's We're still very much split in this time period. So the people who are buying this book, the person who is paying for its publication and everybody else involved, would have uh, an ideology that's much more compatible with thinking slavery is either a good thing or an acceptable thing. And that is relevant, isn't it? It makes this book very, very interesting, or at least I think it does. And I think that's where a lot of this book's value comes in is the really complicated circumstances around it being written and published. So then imagine my surprise when a few years ago I go on to Goodreads to go like log in and say, yes, I read this book and give it my review. And I see a review on there that says, two stars, I won't be recommending this book. Two stars, I won't be recommending this book. The first book published by a Black Briton, his life story, 30 pages long, I won't be recommending it. Why? Like, why would somebody not recommend other people read this book? Well, this is not just me having a go at one reviewer who didn't like a book that I think is important. Of course, people can read books and not like them and review them negatively. It's more that this review is indicative of a wider problem of dismissal with this book because people don't like what this man said about his own life. They don't like it. It makes them feel uncomfortable and so they don't like it. What this review actually said is, I don't know if he wrote this stuff in here to appeal to and to appease to the white Calvinists who were buying it, or, and this is really what they said, it was what was in his heart. So I won't be recommending this book. That's what they said. That is what they said. They don't know if this was really his own thoughts in his heart, or if he was just saying this to pull the wool over the eyes of these white Calvinists to get their money, so they won't recommend the book. Um, and they're not wrong. They aren't wrong. We don't we don't know that. Because if you think about the context in which this book was written and published, it kind of seems like it's possible, isn't it? That he didn't believe any of this. And he's just saying this because the woman who's paying for its publication is a slave owner. She has this Calvinist ideology that would tell you actually slavery is a great thing because it brings people to God. So when he says in this book, and he really does say this, that his only regret at being taken away from his family in Africa is that he could not go back to them and convert them to Christianity. He views them as ignorant, barbarian savages. This is how he views his, his family back in Africa. 
Slavery is really the best thing that ever happened to him because it converted him to Christianity, taught him about God and taught him about his own worthlessness. This is really what he's saying. And in fact, it is with great regret he looks back on the day he was ever given his freedom because his happiest days were when he was enslaved. This is what this man says in these 30 pages about his own life of enslavement. He thinks it was a great thing. It taught him about God. It brought him to Christianity. The people who owned him and enslaved him read the Bible to him. They bought him Christian books. He thinks it was a great thing. So yeah, this reviewer is right. We don't know if what is in this book is really what this man would have said when he was going to bed at night and putting his head on the pillow and speaking to his wife, or if it's what he would have told his children as they were growing up and he was trying to teach them about the world. We don't know that. We don't know if this is what he thought about his life in those quiet moments of reflection when he has no reason to lie to anyone, or if this is what he thought when he was on his deathbed. We don't know. We don't know that. And actually, the context within which this was written and published might suggest that what he is saying in here is designed to appeal to that white Calvinist slave owning audience who are going to want to hear a man who is thankful for having been enslaved. That is very possible. It is possible that the first voice of a black Briton that we have in print is lies. He's lying to us. He's trying to kind of say whatever he needs to say to get that money to help his family. I personally think that's fascinating. However, it's also equally likely that this man wasn't lying to us. In fact, we know that if this was the truth of what was in his heart, he is not the only black person in Europe in the 18th century saying slavery is a great thing because it converts people to Christianity. In fact, we have a black academic about 30 years before this who writes an entire thesis about how wonderful slavery is because it is converting black Africans to Christianity. He writes a whole thesis on it. So he's not the only person saying this. The man in this book is not the only black man in Europe in the time saying that slavery is a great thing because it converts people to Christianity. He's not. So it, it is very possible that what he's saying inside this book is his real opinion. It's very possible that this man who had been captured from slavery as a child lived in enslavement and we know that he witnessed unpleasant things. He looked back on all of that and he viewed it as the best thing that had ever happened to him. And he truly regretted the day he was ever given his freedom. It's possible. It is perfectly possible. And yet it is that that allows people to dismiss it. And it is not just casual readers who pick this up and it makes them feel uncomfortable. And so they're like, Ugh, I, I don't know how to react to this. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to pick it up and it was going to be an uplifting story of overcoming adversity and then, you know, going for abolition. And then it's this, this man saying that slavery was the best thing that ever happened to him. It's not just the casual readers, it's the academics too. They pick this up, they acknowledge it, they say, hey, this was the first publication by a Black Briton, let's kind of look at it a little bit. But actually, we can kind of just dismiss everything that he says, because mm, it's probable that he was lying. Like, if you just look at the context surrounding what he's writing, he's probably just lying, he's probably being manipulated, even if he thinks this is what he believes, he's probably just being gaslighted into that by the people around him. So I think we can probably just dismiss this and not, and not interact with it. 65 people, I think, have registered themselves as having read this on the Goodreads website. 65. Um, his contemporary and fellow Black author of the 18th century, Aluda Equiano, has over 12,000 people who have registered his book as having been read. Um, his book is longer, it is longer, and probably is a little bit more exciting. He's a pretty good storyteller, Equiano, but 12,000 people is a lot more than 65. And interestingly, Equiano is also accused of lying by academics in his book. He has these several chapters detailing his childhood in Africa and remembering what it was like very fondly. 
And yet some academics, a sizable amount, say he was not born in Africa. We have direct evidence that shows he was born on a plantation in South Carolina. That man never stepped foot in Africa as a child. He was not raised in Africa. This is a complete fabrication. He had lied about a childhood in Africa in order to kind of connect with his audience and give them that real kind of feeling of, of that real story of being stolen into enslavement. And yet academics don't dismiss his work because of that. In fact, he is one of the most important and beloved black authors that we have in British history. So why do we ignore this guy? Why, why do we say, oh, we don't know if he's telling the truth, so we'll just kind of throw his book on the heap of things that we're not gonna regard. He's one of five, that's right, five, count them on one hand, black British writers of this period five and what we're just going to throw his book away and say it's not valuable to us because he might be lying because we don't like what he's saying I don't know that doesn't seem like a compelling enough reason to me to ignore the first black man who puts his words onto page from the 18th century I do not think it is a valid reason to throw away the value of his book so that is why I am extremely defensive of this book and hopefully you will understand now why it is so important that people defend the fact that he very well might have thought and believed these things. And it's OK that we don't know it, because this is the only glimmer into his life that we get. But it's still an important one. So, yes, I would recommend you read this book and hopefully you understand now why I'm so defensive of its value. There you go, I've finished now. <laughs> I finished so I won't stay on like for too long but um gosh she's she's kneeling down one second I'm a bit tired of standing so thank you for those of you who stayed I can get close to the microphone and do some ASMR if you want um thank you for those of you who stayed I really appreciate it and everybody who turned up at any stage um yeah thank you so much and those of you who are coming back to watch it later 80 okay thank you that's good that's good because that gives me a little bit of leeway in case I kind of go over a bit. I think under like by a couple of minutes is okay. It's like if you start getting into like 25 minute territory. So thank you so much for everybody for turning up. I really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'm gonna go because I've already stolen like 22 minutes of your day. Thank you, thank you. And I hope you did find it interesting. And really, I do hope that you read this book. Yes, it is a bit uncomfortable reading what he has to say about his own life, but um, yeah. Oh yeah, so the hopefully you can see it, but it is, and uh, so it's a narrative of the life of James Albert Ocasor Um it, it has a longer title that was the original one. You can find it completely for free on Google Books if you just type in Ocasor Groniosaur. There you go, that's what it looks like, um, into Google Books. And then you just set the time period to 18th century only. It will come up with original copies of this from the time period that you can read. And honestly, like you'll be able to read it in an hour. Um, so it's a really interesting one to read. It is uncomfortable. The stuff that he says is is quite difficult, um, but he said it. So, you know, <laughs> I think we should read it. Anyway, I'm going to go. But thank you so much. And I was like mega nervous when I first started that. And before I like walked on, I was like, oh, no, I don't want to do this. Um, but I did it and I feel good afterwards. So hopefully tomorrow it will go well. And yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. I really, really do appreciate it. I'm going to go now. Bye.